So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, February the 17th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 196. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad that you're here. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below and you'll see links for further reading and also the shout out for today. The link will be down there. If you want to know how to submit your own question, please go to the website called thewaytobe.org and click on the page titled The Way to Be. So let's get right into it. These were topics that were submitted over the past week. And uh, as you can see from the opening, uh, my observation hives are doing very well this year. This past week we had some really warm weather. I guess we're in the top three warmest winters on record. Uh, also, the cherry blossoms uh, out in Washington, D.C. are three weeks ahead of time, ahead of schedule. So weird things are going on with the weather. But uh, what was interesting is observation hives. Very difficult to get through winter if they're in unheated spaces. And all of mine are in unheated spaces. So it's out in my Way to Be Academy building, which is just a fancy name for a shed. And uh, I was interested in seeing I fed one of three observation hives with uh, pro suite at the end of the year end of summer last year and the other two were just left with whatever resources they happen to have and if you look at the video sequence in the opening that's an unfed colony huge numbers and uh, they are doing extremely well with plenty of honey still above them so they have lots of room to move up they're not vented, um, they have a single entrance, and that particular one has four medium height frames, and they're in groups of three. Groups of three in an observation hive. So one center frame and the one on either side is apparently the key to getting them through winter. The other thing that's good about the observation hives right now is I can pull the inserts from underneath and see what kind of varroa mite drop I have because there's a bottom screen in each of those. And I can pull that out and kind of look and see what's going on in the hive, see what the condition is, see what kind of condensation might be dripping down. Condensation has not been a big problem there either. And as I mentioned, the building is unheated. It has south-facing windows, so it warms up when we get a sunny day. If not, same temperature as everything else. And then all I do is put this Reflectex around it. I created like pillowcases out of this, single thickness, and that's all that sits over it. They don't have big insulation panels on them either. So this is kind of the, the test. But again, as I mentioned, this is kind of a mild winter, so we don't know what's going on, but the numbers are big. And again, no supplemental feeding, just letting them have what they collected on their own through the year, and letting them, of course, swarm too. So the other two swarmed. The one that was featured in the opening did not swarm once last year. Very interesting. So there'll be more coming up about that <clears throat> as time progresses because we're going to do inspections and evaluations of all the hives. Oh, the other thing is we talked about um, losses. I think, in my opinion, it's too early to really report your losses from your backyard apiary. Uh, we had a breakfast at IHOP and talked about bees, so that's one of my favorite things to do, by the way, is get together like that. And some people lost 10 out of 12 colonies of bees. Uh, one beekeeper lost 35% of their hives, which seemed to be pretty standard. I've lost 2 out of 23, which is not bad. I mean, it's not perfect. Everybody would like to have a perfect... Uh, survival rate coming through uh, but it's interesting to me that also we talk about the different configurations not everybody this is you know the bee club that i belong to the northwest pennsylvania beekeepers association 
And uh, we all keep our bees very differently. So it's not like, you know, I come in there and tell people how I, you know, do my hives and a lot of other people go, yeah, I'm going to do mine the same way. No, they're still doing things very different. Uh, the ways that they've decided to do it, top venting, top entrances, insulation, no insulation, wrapping their hives, not wrapping their hives. And you already know I don't wrap or insulate my hives other than the insulated inner cover, which is also one of the things we're going to go over today with one of the questions that was submitted. So let's get right into question number one, which comes from Ed, St. Charles, St. Charles, Maine. So anyway, lost my first colony, probably due to freezing. I have a long lang and didn't relocate or reduce the brood area. I left too many frames and left the colony next to the entrance, which was one inch long by three eighths of an inch high. Can you talk about hive management for long laying hives? Okay, so the, the hive management for me really doesn't change that much. So for those of you who don't know, long laying sloth are horizontal hives. And that means that all your frames are on one level. And uh, again, people manage those in a lot of different ways. Some people have multiple entrances down the length of the hive. And so they'll open the one that's nearest the brood as they you know, consume their resources going through winter or coming into spring instead of reversing boxes, which some people do. Uh, in spring, they'll just open the entrance that's right next to where the cluster of bees happens to be getting through winter. So one description here is that uh, I left too many frames and uh, left the colony next to the entrance. Now, I don't move my brood frames away from the entrance at all. And I also don't checkerboard brood frames either, which means where we have frames of brood, where there's brood production going on, that's where the eggs and the open larvae and the capped pupae and all that happen over and over once it's established. It kind of stays the same. It just fills and empties, fills and empties as new, as new bees emerge. And it doesn't really move until wintertime gets here. And then they gradually migrate along with the honey. So... Now this is an interesting thing too. All of my horizontal hives are doing really well and the long Langstroth hive is also doing really well. Single entrance, no vents, but my single entrance is larger than the one described here. Here Ed says he has one inch long, so it's only, it's only like that, and three eighths of an inch high. Mine is three inches long. And uh, I don't know that that makes a huge difference, but uh, also that entrance is well off the bottom. So if there are dead bees on the bottom, they're well away from the entrance and they don't block it and things like that. Um, and my bees with thermals that I shoot on the outside of it, it's uh, 2 by 4 2 by 12 2 by 10 stock like that. So it's not quite 2 inches thick, but uh, that's all there is. There's no insulation on the side walls. There is insulation on top of the frames, and this year that was double bubble. So it's the first year I did that also. So we did the insulation, which also, by the way, I used as a gasket. So when the top of the hive comes down, I had this cut and traced it all the way around the top of the box. And then when I closed it up, it sandwiched over the double bubble or reflect text or whatever you've chosen to use and uh, that created an absolute airtight seal and created a there's no heat leaking there which was demonstrated again and validated with the thermal imaging of the FLIR C2 is what I use but some people just shoot regular temperature sensors and things like that. I think that was a big improvement for my horizontal hives this year because in the past I had an insulated cover with rigid foam board R10. And uh, the thing about that was uh, we still had, we had to have air leaks where the top of the hive and the hive base come together. So we had a compound and improvement this year with no leaking of warmth or airflow through the top of the horizontal hive uh, with that. So I think that probably helped it. The other thing was maybe we had better mite management this year. My mite numbers were low. I took advantage of late year opportunities to treat for mites with oxalic acid vaporization and all the hive types uh, work for that. The lands hives are doing really well. Now the lands and the long Langstroth uh, were not fed any supplementals at all. Spring, summer, fall, nothing. 
whatever they brought in, they brought in, and they ended up with a big surplus of honey. So one of Ed's concerns here too is he may have left too many honey frames on and that could be a real deal because what happens is further into the hive, if we've left way more than the bees are gonna use, how much do they need? About 40 pounds in general, but this year with a mild winter, my bees did not use 40 pounds of stored honey in any of the hives. Better to have too much than not enough unless it's way too much. And by that I mean whether you're vertical or horizontal, if you have a bunch of frames of capped honey well down the line where the bees are not occupying or not adjacent to it and they're not controlling the climate there, which they don't in the wintertime, they're really just controlling the climate around the cluster and of course there's secondary warmth and there's humidity coming off of the bees and everything else. And it's that humidity that if we get these really cold temperature days and then we get a rapid warm up. It's that key there is the rapid warm up, which means then um, we have warm air flowing through the hive and uh, condensation forms on the surface of the honey and can increase condensation inside your hive overall. Now, would that alone wipe out your bees? No. And it's because we worry about condensation directly on the cluster. The bees getting damp themselves, not so much the environment that they're in. And if you're looking at uh, the plans that we have on my website again that show you how to build your long lang stroth or any of the hives that uh, we've arrived at now screens underneath with catch trays below that are a great benefit when you talk about condensation inside the hive on the interior walls which the bees need and how do i see that happening by the way i'm not going to open a hive in the middle of winter but i have those observation hives so then i can see where and how the condensation forms and then you'll see the bees on the outside of that, on the mantle, we call it, of the cluster for winter when they're in a state of torpor and all the activities in the center, all the protected bees are in the center, the older bees are on the outside. They're licking condensation off of the surfaces, the interior surface of the hive. The other thing is that because it's an observation hive, we can see that even with the cluster down here and frames above them, where is the condensation forming? is forming outside the cluster about midway to the lower third and then below that because where's the entrance down there. So wherever the dew point can be achieved, that's where they get condensation. But the, the comforting part of that is the bees were using that. So bees that can't fly out when it's really cold outside and the wind is blowing and it's hostile and would kill the bees when they do cleansing flights and things like that. That condensation inside the hive is critical for their survival, or at least it improves their survival. And again, some of the other hives, all of my Langstroth standard vertical hives had fondant on them. So we're talking about, this is, you know, every time I mention it, but anyway, the fondant is on top of all of the standard Langstroth hives. And someone else wrote, and I did not include their question today because it was kind of common and not uh, really a problem. But when we cut away the hole here on the face of this fondant and the bees are working it, because this sits directly on an insulated inner cover and you can see through the plastic, they can see the condensation that forms on the interior surface of this plastic. And that water that collects on that interior surface is directly beneficial to the bees as they metabolize the fondant. So they're getting their additional moisture right here. And also if the condensation forms on that surface of the fondant itself, all the better because that's already turning it into a liquid. It's in a semi-liquid state already, but it benefits the bees as they're trying to metabolize it. So bees need moisture in winter. So I don't think that's what's killing the bees. And the other thing is we have um, humidifiers, not humidifiers, humidity sensors. So the relative humidity, even with condensation on the interior walls, registered inside that capsule that I made out of Reflectex or double bubble, whatever you want to call it, uh, was at averaging 65% relative humidity. So that's pretty darn good because we've had weather outside uh, where it's in the 90s, of course. So the humidity inside that colony was pretty well controlled. Good stuff overall. And so my management for the Long Langstroth hives, what direction do the entrances face? They all face south or southeast. So the other thing is the 
the holes I bought Dr. Leo Shirashkin's, um, you know, lands hives, they come with three holes in them. I close those all up and I only have the hole that's closest to the eastern side of the hive open. And again, they're doing great. And, uh, and when I say they're doing great, it means that this last warm cycle that we had, they were very active, all three horizontal hives. And I'm just gonna take the guess, it is a guess because I haven't inspected them yet, but based on entrance activity alone, the Long Langstroth hive, that colony is just doing a fantastic job with a lot of activity coming and going. And the Lance hives were running a tight second, but then again, maybe they have more resources inside and they don't need that much. Uh, there's not enough to inspire them to really get going. Another reason that the Long Langstroth hive may be flying sooner and with more foragers than the Lance hives, Lance hives are heavily insulated. The Long Langstroth hive uh, has no insulation except for the thickness of the wood, and of course the additional insulation directly above the bees. And so the surface of that wood heats up pretty fast on a sunny day, which is exactly what we had. We hit 60 degrees. And uh, so all of the uninsulated hives, because we also have the Apame hives here too, uninsulated hives were flying quicker earlier and had more activity on the landing boards. So the, the proof of the pudding, of course, will be in spring when we start to open them up and do real inspections to see what's going on. But uh, the insulated versus uninsulated, more activity on the landing boards, but we'll find out what the numbers are like uh, in spring. And the other thing is they're not on equal ground as far as supplemental feeding because the vertical hive configurations all had the fondant on them. It's an emergency survival feed. And again, the observation hives did not have any of that feed. My vertical, of course, the stacked nucleus hives, which are three sets of five deep frames. None of those have surplus feed on, no fondant, nothing, because now we're gonna make, of course, these comparisons. We're gonna see what goes on. But everything is looking great out there. But the other part of the management is that I just keep them off the ground. So the entrances are, on the horizontal hives, they're even taller than they need to be, but 16 to 18 inches to stay out of skunk territory, skunk range. And the skunks are cruising the beehives right now, but they're just eating up the dead bees that flew out from cleansing flights and didn't make it back. So all good stuff that's going on. Very good, feeling very good about uh, survival through the winter. And not just survival, but I'm in a pickle because if that activity levels on these hives is any indicator, even the hive that fell over the last time that was part of my opening sequence for the Q&A, it has so many bees doing so much work. Um, our trees are, are blooming early, like the maple trees. You can see buds on top of them. So if you want to see if trees in your area are already providing for your bees, get a pair of binoculars out and look at the treetops. And so, and they're even bringing in nectar from somewhere. I don't even know where it's coming from, but when I'm looking at the cells and the frames, and again, this is with the observation hives, uncapped cells lower down, and they already are half full of uh, nectar. So they're bringing in surplus already. So go on to question number two, it comes from Joel from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Since you've started using the bubble wrap insulation, have you changed the way you build your insulated covers using the Be Smart Designs insulated cover? I'm getting ready to build another one and was wondering the best way to include the bubble wrap in the construction besides just adding it to the top of the foam insulation. Okay, and that was my drawing for the thumbnail for today. So I'm gonna show you that again right now. I'm gonna fold this back, so. We don't put anybody's email out there, but it hasn't changed. I did a video and probably should link the video, but the Be Smart Designs insulated inner cover. You know, I have so many of those around here and uh, why would I not have one right now when I'm talking about it? Because I'm obviously not prepared. But uh, the Be Smart Designs insulated inner cover uh, it comes with a plastic shell around it, domed bottom. I interviewed the owner of the company um, at Hive Life, and so that video is, is on there, the Hive Life conference video. You can see all of the things they make. But uh, inside that hard plastic, there is uh, polystyrene, and it's an R10. So the polystyrene and the way it all fits together, 
if you look at this drawing, um, the polystyrene of the B Smart Designs inner cover sits down on top of your upper, which for me would be a honey super going into winter because this is where all the winter stores are for the bees. And of course, the brood box is down below that. But there's this air gap around the edge of it. So if you look here, it looks like a fillet almost. I use Great Stuff expansion foam and I run it through the entire interior circumference where the feeder shim gets put on top. So that's what this is right here, expansion foam that bonds the polystyrene to the wooden box out here, which is either a medium or a deep or whatever you want it to be, depending on what you plan to put inside for your feed. For me, these are mediums, and the medium will house any kind of liquid feeder or fondant feeder, which right now is what I have illustrated here. But the preparation that changed, uh, I still do the expansion foam around there, but now I have this reflect text, which is this stuff that we just showed. And uh, I run it around the entire interior surface of the feeder shim. And then you can staple it to the wood here, which is the fastest and easiest way to attach. And if you ever wanted to tear it off later, you could. It also glues on pretty good. So you can use tight bond and just spread tight bond between these two and stick it on there. But then you're really committed. If it's just stapled, you can pull it off later if you want. The center hole that the bees come up through to feed on the fondant is right here. And then all I do is I take Reflectex and I roll it and I just... So I just take it and do this number, and then it sits like that, right on top. And I push it in so that it touches all four interior surfaces of that feeder shim, and then it makes it nice and snug so we get insulation, plus we have an airflow barrier, even though really past the fondant pack here, you would not have much airflow at all, so this just triples up on that. And this is a lot of insulation, dead air space, and then a polystyrene outer cover sits up here, and I prefer the B-Max polystyrene covers, and I put those out. That's the whole configuration. So, what does that do? Well, it just uh, keeps things warm and toasty because really the most meaningful insulation is right down here uh, where the bees get right here because what I don't want to form anywhere in here, I don't want any condensation over them. There's another thing, this hole right here is dead center. I don't want to put any liquid syrup dead center over my bees in winter. Some people are talking about using syrup in wintertime, heavy syrup. Some of them even want to feed back the honey to the bees directly over that. I highly, highly recommend not putting any kind of feeder tank or liquid syrup over the center of your cluster of bees in winter time. And this is one of the tanks, by the way, that just came out by the same company. By just came out, I mean last year. And it has a spud right here that would sit perfectly directly over that hole. The problem I have there is that it's centered directly over your bees. So now once things warm up, that's fine, no problem. But it's these transitional days. So right now, look at today. Um, did I even mention the temperature, by the way? So outside today, it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus four Celsius. We had 60 degrees just a few days ago. If a tank like this or any tank, I don't care if it's, you know, a bottle, if there's air in this, if your liquid level was here and this is full of air and uh, this is centered over the top of your cluster of bees, and we go from 30 degrees Fahrenheit to 60 or 65 degrees Fahrenheit by mid-afternoon, the air in this is going to expand because it's well above the insulations down below. So this box up here around your drinker is the outside temperature. So when that outside temperature expands, you have Charles Law going on right here. The gas expands and pushes your liquid out right through the bottom and it doesn't matter if it's a mason jar feeder or this or my newest and favorite feeder thing which is the bee buffet whatever it is it's going to express syrup right down onto your bees so what's the fix i would suggest uh cutting other holes so if you've got now the insulated inner cover from bee smart designs you're not going to want to go cutting a bunch of holes in that but uh, if you had a regular inner cover, 
I would put a hole off to the side towards the back. And uh, however close you can get your feet or to a back corner, that's where I would put it. Then I would have the hole with the screen so that you can put your feeder on that. Because then if we get these dramatic temperature swing days, the syrup is going to express out, but it's not going to be directly over the cluster of your bees. So it'll be going down the side and it'll be on the bottom. And hopefully as the day warms, your bees that are interested in that will recover the drippings that are going down on the bottom of your hive. Why not put it close to the front? Uh, because I want it to have a lot of travel distance to get from the back to the front. And that's because if you have your liquid container up above towards the front and you get that expansion and you get that expression of your syrup down, where is it going to go? Right out onto your landing board. What's that going to potentially cause? Robbing in spring right now. The bees are hunting things on warm days. So all food for thought, of course, as I've learned, people will do whatever they want. I'm just putting out information that lets you know what I'm doing and trying to explain why I do it. Question number three comes from Rob Shipley from uh, Cheshire, Oregon. Three of my four hives are still alive and doing well. I run a, condensate, a condensing style hive with a solid bottom board, no upper entrance. I also run a top shim board with two and a half inches of EPS insulation. My bees seem to move up to the top boxes, which were full of honey, almost immediately because of the warmth. And so I'm hearing I need to rotate my boxes in March to keep them from swarming. But I think they might move back up into the honey box on top for the warmth and have no food source immediate contact. So I'm thinking to leave them as is and monitoring them closely. What are your thoughts? Okay, now this comes up. These are beekeeping practices, right? Whether or not to rotate your boxes and uh, that happens in springtime and the discussion about doing that before they swarm. This is not the time of year to be doing that, at least not where I live. Even if you do it, let's say I'm saying, yeah, rotate your boxes. When are you going to do that? When we're going to have consistently warm weather. You run the risk of damaging brood if it's spanning between two boxes and you're going to tear one and put it underneath. Um, the idea is to relieve congestion up above so that your bees can then uh, move up and start storing the nectar and resources as the nectar flow kicks in. So when would that happen for us here where I live when the dandelions are blooming? And I don't mean you just spotted a couple of dandelions in the countryside. I mean a field of dandelions starts to show up. That kind of ties in with when everything else in the environment is waking up and you start getting a bunch of nectar coming in. And this is where we talk about you know, the differences in hive management. For those who have upper vents and upper entrances and things like that, which some people still adhere to and that's perfectly fine. I don't do that. But uh, brood would be up near those uh, the upper vents as well as things start to warm up. So they would move up, they consume the resources there, and they start brooding right there. They do the same uh, in colonies that have no upper entrance and no top vent. Uh, the difference is with the venting up there, they're encouraged to stay there and keep brooding in that area, even though there's a bottom entrance, which you'll notice if you have an upper and a bottom entrance, they almost ignore the bottom entrance completely. So uh, this is my philosophy on that and the logic behind it. I don't want them to vent off that warm air that they've saved up there. That's why I go with uh, no top entrance, no top vent. This is also why I don't uh, rotate the boxes. So I don't take what is now the brood box and pull the empty uh, super now, which is underneath. We'd pull that and put it on top because it's got all the space and we bring the brood down and put them on the bottom board for spring. Uh, one of the reasons for that too is that I use deep brood boxes. So some of my hives are up to double deeps. It depends on which one, but the standard is a deep 10 frame. You can use eight also. It's up to you. And then the honey super is above that. Now, based on what I'm seeing already, I do not uh, have a bunch of brood up in the top where they've consumed all of uh, the honey that's stored up there. They still have plenty of honey above them. Even with the fondant on, even with the emergency resources and stuff like that, the brood is actually almost in between the two boxes. So what would happen if I already have it in my head that I'm going to pull that box and lift the box of the brood and then I'm going to swamp them around to make sure there's space above them. If the brood is shaped like this, we just cut it in half 
and did this number. It's a terrible way to super your bees. It's also why I just don't do it. You know, I did that in the past because a lot of people said to do it and I was tearing brood directly in half. So, and some people do all medium boxes. So they are interchangeable and that's the kind of the logic behind that. Then it doesn't matter which one is your brood box, which one is your super, all the equipment's the same, all the hive thicknesses are the same, but I've yet to go into a bottom two boxes on a hive in spring or early summer uh, that did not have brood bridging both of those medium boxes. And the reason for that is that uh, the size of the brood pattern is pretty consistent. So that's how Layens, for example, came up with his frame size, right? So even if you're just using the Langstroth deep box, we get a little arc above it that goes into the next box. So my bottom two boxes are pretty static. Because... Uh, I challenge almost anybody to pull apart two medium boxes and not find out that you just split your brood in half. So if you under super, now you really disrupted the bees and you impacted them at a time when they're in brood upswing or when production is increasing. So my fix for this concern about, uh, is that a trigger for swarming? It would be if you left them like that. And by that I mean, rather than under super, just super the hive as uh, things really become productive in the hive. So the triggers for your bees to swarm. Plenty of resources coming in, that means protein and uh, you know the carbohydrate, the nectar sources. It's what's coming through the door, not what they've already got stored. So that's interesting too. Amount of space that they have um, so that they don't feel congested. So that's why in spring your biggest advantage to helping to stop your bees from swarming is to super the hive. So not necessarily rotate the boxes, but add another box up above before they have maxed out all of their frames. If you have a 10 frame hive and that medium box that's on top of your deep, if you're doing what I've recommended, uh, you have to put that next box up before they're full or you've already decided to let them swarm and requeen. So it's not just a straight single answer. People that are trying to get a lot of honey out of their hives, of course, the last thing they want is a swarm. So then you would be supering early in spring. So you'd be putting that third box on uh, instead of rotating the super. Now the other thing is those that have vents will find upper vents will cause the cluster and that brood not to be encouraged to move down. However, if you have a single entrance and no upper venting or anything else like that, as things warm up, the colony naturally migrates their brood production down while backfilling those upper cells with honey. So that's what I do. And it's the same with the long Langstroth hives. The brood will be moving down the line if the only entrance is over here. And then, oh, here comes the warm up and here comes spring. Even though they have a lot of honey left over here, now they start backfilling the honey over here where the brood is, and as this brood emerges, they start migrating the brood back where? Towards where the ventilation is. There's another layer to this. So I'm gonna throw another monkey wrench in. And that is uh, not having an upper entrance, not having an upper vent at all, period. Uh, what else is happening? And there are studies going on that uh, I always say wait, you know, for the studies to finish and for them to publish, but because this is just a layered reinforcement of what I'm already doing. In other words, I'm not changing what I'm doing anymore. Uh, I did change and add more insulation directly on top of the colony, but I've also left the sides uninsulated. Why did I do that? To see how they do without it. Because if they do okay without it, why do I need to add it? So I don't. And the good news too is I have members in our beekeeping association that do wrap their hives, that do add insulation, that do block everything up while others of us don't. And because we're in similar climate, uh, now we can compare notes and say, how'd they go for you? Where, what was your landing board directing at? You know, what are you looking at in spring? And so if we find out that those heavily insulated hives are not doing any better than the uninsulated hives, then there's no need for me to add that material and to do that extra work um, for winter or summer even. Because that's the other thing, if you're doing all the insulating for winter, why wouldn't you just leave it on for summer as well? 
Well, it's because a lot of the insulation that wraps these hives is designed for a specific sized hive. A deep and a medium, two deeps, for example. And then if they start to, you know, expand their hives or contract their hives, depending on the population, then these insulation boards and stuff that go around it would also have to be changed and altered to adapt to those heights. So there again, I don't have to do that because I don't put those insulation outer wraps or panels or things like that on my hives at all. So it's kind of if they don't need it, why would I do it? Now, on the other hand, if I was finding a whole bunch of dead outs, which a lot of people are in my state, uh, then I have to rethink how I'm, what I'm doing. You know, what's the cause? Why did they die? But the monkey wrench is the science of what's going on in a colony that does not have insulation above it. And that is we have higher humidity potentially up there which I found not to be true. So it's at the cluster and above the cluster, it's hovering in the 60s as far as relative humidity goes. And the other thing is, is are they oxygen deficient up there? They are, if we're talking about people. I think a human needs a minimum of 16% oxygen just to survive. That's the bare minimum. We want our oxygen levels in the 20s, obviously, but we could survive bare minimum 16% oxygen. Honeybees are not people. Honeybees can handle a much higher CO2 level and lower oxygen levels than we can. So we need to stop thinking of the bees as people and think of them as insects instead. Because do we really need to force oxygen in there? Do we need to turn on a fan? Do we need to force ventilation in there to make sure they're getting the air that they need in American Sign Language? Need it? Um, no, because there is an entrance down there the bees are fully capable of circulating air as they need it, when they need it, for the brood, which is the critical area. So this deficient oxygen area, this humidity, and this heat area, so this is why summer and winter, so even in midsummer I'm not venting and things like that, because guess what is having a problem surviving inside that climate? The Varroa destructor mite. So a Varroa destructor mites need more oxygen and need a climate that is more sensitive than what the bees need, there may be advantages that we're completely unaware of when it comes to the stratification of the heat, humidity, you know, CO2 levels and everything else that uh, in one study had the mite reproduction reduced to 1% of what it would have been had they had more airflow and a different temperature environment. And this is not just winter, I'm talking about summertime also. What if this is just, this is just us having tea, thinking about that climate. What if, cause we've heard about those thermal uh, treatments for mites, which personally I'm still waiting for final findings on, but what if your worker bees that had mites on them Realize that the mites are distressed if they move up inside the hive into a higher temperature, lower oxygen level in the summertime and found that the mites were liberating themselves from the abdomen of the bees. Now, I don't have any evidence that that happens. I'm just speculating. If they don't like that environment, but the bees can handle it, can't the bees move into a part of the hive where they can actually get those varroa destructor mites off of them? We need to talk to the mite geniuses out there. We need to talk to Dr. Peck and... Dr. Samuel Ramsey. I'll bet they know stuff like that. But these are the studies that are going on in laboratory environments. What can the bees handle? What can the mites not handle? Or what is enough of a detriment to the mite that it limits, reduces, or stops their reproduction? I like the sound of that story. But anyway, that's, uh, those are the changes because when I designed my first uh, long Langstroth hive, by the way, I had venting through the top, just a little bit, just enough airflow so there was no condensation on the roof. And I had stainless steel with um, sandwiched, um, and it's still there, by the way, in the current design. There is a stainless steel mesh, and then there are stainless steel screens over the top of it that allows some airflow. So in other words, it wouldn't create a vacuum, and it also would allow the expansion and, and the migration and, and of air leaving that cavity, because wherever you have a cavity, you don't want to make it airtight. Um, so that's still there, but as far as uh, what travels down into my compartment where the bees are living, 
that actually uh, there is no real airflow there anymore. And it's not that I made it air sealed. It's those four inch um, red oak cover boards that are, let's face it, they're not so precisely cut that they come right together and provide an air seal. The bees did that themselves and they did that by propolizing every joint they could find. So the bees closed up that uh, any air leaks through the cover boards, which subsequently would have vented them off into the, the roof. So the bees are telling us things if we could uh, pay attention to them. So, uh, so for Bob, let's see. What are your thoughts? So yeah, monitor them close, expand the hive. I know I went off on a tangent about why I do what I do. And the reason that I'm explaining this in detail is because I find that when I get in conversation with people that they, it's as if they never heard me say that. In other words, so I'm trying to really explain the advantages. The bees have told us they don't want upper venting and upper entrances. Uh, they do that by propolizing and by the cavities that they select themselves. This also is my answer to the discussion about screen bottom boards that are open underneath the hive. That if you want to find out, um, and this is just, you know, there's no reason to, to tell me you're wrong, he's right. No, just find out. Let the bees be your source of information. If you're setting up a... Um, you know, swarm traps, people are putting up swarm traps this time of year. So my question for the people that use open screen bottom boards with no insert and no enclosure at all and swear by it because their bees have made it year after year with that configuration, um, would the bees move into that box if it had that open bottom like that? Now up here where I am in Pennsylvania and probably a lot of the northern states, um, if you're setting up a trap for a swarm and you had an open screen bottom board, I'm going to bet you that uh, your bees won't move into it. And then I found out that some people block up the whole hive and make it completely dark and just the single entrance going into it. And then after the bees have moved in, after they've committed to the space, then they pull off the bottom and expose the screen and everything else. So now the bees are committed, they've got their brood and everything else, and then we altered it afterwards. So you can't say then that the bees chose that configuration, that they wanted a completely open bottom board. So, and then my final statement about any configuration changes is always, please do both. Uh, do one with, one without, and just make your comparisons. If you've got 10 hives, five with, five without, if you've got four, two and two, and so on. If you change everything all at once at the same time, you'll not know uh, whether it was just a mild winter that year or if you just had a really good nectar flow that year because we need to see them in the same environment, same conditions, just with a different configuration to see how well they work out. So here's Terry from Troy, Missouri. I'm assembling another 15 or so hives, bottom boards, ladder racks, deeps, feeder shims, and telescoping covers, as well as about 30 medium supers. I assume the eco wood finish is still holding up, although I think it's just under two years that you started using it. I just rewatched your July 26, 2021 video where you applied it to a bunch of hives. My main question is, do the bees still seem to coat the inside surface with propolis just as they do with other untreated hives? So yeah, and the, I've learned a lot about the eco wood, by the way, which I really like. That's what's on that hive right there. That's why it looks so dark. Um, as far as the surface goes, it looks like it's untreated other than it changes color. You can't tell that there's anything on the wood or impregnating it. And then the question is regarding the interior of the wood. And somebody else asked me recently too, do you put eco wood on the inside and outside of the box also? I do. So I dip the whole box in there, inside, outside, all the joints, every surface that's exposed gets the eco wood treatment. And uh, the thing is, 
Eagle wood has its strengths and weaknesses. And one of the things is I like the way it looks. I like natural looking hives in the landscape, by the way. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been driving down a country road and somebody's got a bunch of hives that are painted white and you can spot those from a mile away. And I mean literally a mile away. So if you want everybody to know that you have hives and where they are, that's one way to do it. Paint bright colors. I like the eco wood because it looks like weathered wood. It looks dark, it looks natural, and it kind of blends into the countryside. But then of course I come along and put a bright white polystyrene cover on it, so those need to be painted too. The eco wood prevents the wood from rot. It's absolutely doing a fantastic job of that. I see no deterioration in the wood. Now another weak spot is though, uh, it doesn't seem to prevent your wood from cupping, for example. So I have some of the nucleus hives with the mi migratory wooden covers on them. Aha, I do have something. This is treated with eco wood, inside out. Just looks like weathered wood. And eco wood, by the way, every time it rains on it and dries out, it gets darker. So it looks pretty cool. But we have these little splits and checks on it. So tiny cracks here. Uh, now this piece was not glued all the way across when it's screwed down with three screws here for this cross piece that would stabilize the wood. Uh, it did cup up a little bit here, but if I had used uh, tight bond three or something like that, then put them together, then screwed it, it wouldn't have changed at all. So you should know that uh, eco wood doesn't stabilize like the really thin pieces of wood. Uh, so they could cup up a little bit. This is also what eco wood looks like. This is a queen excluder that goes right on the front on the landing board of a hive just to block the entrance. And uh, this is really stable too. And it's been out in the weather. So what I really like is there's no rot or deterioration of the wood but it doesn't necessarily completely stabilize it. But this one is also glued. So if you screw it and glue it and eco wood it, then you're good to go. It takes a place of paint, absolutely. Works fantastic. And uh, so that works. So yes, it's still holding up. And as far as the bees coating the inside, they treat it like the wood's untreated. So, uh, and this year we're building um, rough cut lumber nucleus boxes that are going to be treated with eco wood and here's what i like about it better than than paint for example paint you have to of course paint if you're painting you're doing the outside walls the top and the bottoms but you're not painting the interior surfaces um, but if i dipped it all in eco wood the bees treat it no different so once the eco wood is dry and it soaks in, it goes on like water. It seems like it's not doing anything, but apparently it's doing a lot because I've also done my benches and things like that that are on the countryside. And uh, everything that's wood that's exposed, like when I use eco wood, I go around uh, with my tractor and anything that's made out of wood, I just use the surplus on it and uh, holds up really well and looks rustic. So I like it for many reasons. And eco wood you can get with different tints and stains, different colors in it. I have not used any of those. And again, because they're beehives, I'm just using the natural eco wood with no pigments added at all. So I can't attest to what the colors might do or if the bees could uh, have a problem with whatever that color is composed with. But uh, the company, eco wood themselves, um, swear by the product as being completely safe for bees. So that's the end of question four. Question five, Nancy from Harleysville, PA. I have headless bees outside my hives at this time of year. I can send you pictures if you want two or three of the 33 colonies I am overwintering here in Southeast Pennsylvania. They appear to be dry and only a shell of the bee. All headless with every other part intact. Is this the work of a shrew? I hope the predator is waiting outside the hive when the mortuary bees bring out the dead and not going inside the live colony. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, I have lots of thoughts about it. <clears throat> Shrews are very interesting to me. We have the short-tailed shrew here. And uh, in further, further north, like here in Pennsylvania, the short-tailed shrew is the only one. They're nice and big. Big as far as a shrew goes. Shrews are little. They're meteoric in their, uh, their movements. They're super fast. 
So even if you have, well, let me just cut to the chase. Yes, I think a shrew is eating those bees. But I'm gonna to talk to you about how to get your shrew out, how to make sure it's out, and then how to keep it from going back in. And for those of you who are finding something similar, you find a bunch of dead bees on the landing board, just inside the landing board, piled up around in there. What should you be looking for? Well, shrews pull their heads off. And then where's all the protein in your bee? Like, where's the musculature? It's in the thorax, and that's why the shrews eat out the thorax. So that's why they're empty shells of bees. So everything Nancy is saying here suggests to me that it's a shrew. And it can, it can be bad. Now further north, this is why I mentioned where we are, there's a pygmy shrew. That is a super tiny rascal. So, but what I'm going to tell you about here applies to even the pygmy shrew, which would be the worst because it can get in to the tiniest openings, one centimeter. So um, what I've recommended for years now is a three eighths of an inch opening to your beehive. And that's because, first of all, it's easy to remember three eighths of an inch is bee space. So, and I've done lots of observations. I have video cameras everywhere. This is how I even got a shrew on video camera. Um, it takes a really good camera to catch a shrew. Why? Because they're moving so fast. So what you would get is the hind foot going in your hive or, you know, they're, they're just, their movements are super speedy. And I'll also link a video so you can see what a shrew looks like, by the way, they're very cool. Um, so the thing is the shrews are getting into your hive and they're taking advantage of the fact that your bees are in a cluster. And uh, what else are you gonna find? Any rodent like a shrew. Shrews are distinctive in weight. I'm not sure they're even classified as a rodent now that I'm thinking about it. They have venom, by the way, so a venomous mammal. And, uh, but they produce feces as they go. So wherever they're sitting and munching away, uh, they're also producing feces. So you would see little mammal poop around your hive. Uh, you'll see it on tops of like up in the upper parts of your hive, because what they'll do is they'll scoot up, they go right between the frames, scoot up, they'll be on top. They'll be up in that inner cover. They probably would not go into your fondant pack. So another reason to put a fondant pack up there. But if it were a standard inner cover, they would zip up there and be on it. And they would leave a bunch of their droppings there. And then of course, discarded bee parts. So the cool thing to know about that is um, you can't find the shrews on these warm days when you're inspecting. And that's because they zip right out of that hive when the bees become active. So. Like this pass, I realize time has passed. Now I think I did already reply to Nancy because I had some information that I wanted her kind of to act on right away. And that's because we get these warm days and the landing board is active with bees. You have guard bees everywhere. There is no mouse, there is no shrew inside a hive that's fully active like that. So that's your opportunity to get control of your entrance to prevent that tiny mammal from getting back into your beehive when nightfall comes. So now if we know that we have hives that are actually being attacked by those, look at all your entrances and see if their heights are bigger than three eighths of an inch. I'd really like to know that because I need reinforcement that the three eighths of an inch number is good. Uh, the other thing is you wanna be absolutely sure you can cut hardware cloth. Hardware cloth comes in a lot of different sizes. It's just screen and you can get the three eighths of an inch size. And the reason I recommend that over, let's say a quarter inch hardware cloth is because if you forget and you leave that screen on there and a warm day comes and you took off to Florida or you know, President's Day is coming on Monday and everybody's going and having big parties or whatever, um, the bees flying in and out, getting pollen this time of year would not lose their pollen loads uh, if they're going through a three eighths of an inch opening as frequently as they would if it were down to a quarter inch. So the quarter inch could act a little bit like a pollen trap and be scraping the pollen off the legs of your bees that are trying to get it in to feed their spring brood. So if you go three eighths of an inch, you could leave it on is what I'm saying. If you go smaller than that, then leave it on overnight or leave it on while the temperatures are cold. And then when you get these sunny days, days when your bees would be doing cleansing flights or when they start to go for pollen again, then you go back and you remove your entrance screens during the day, but put them on, of course, before it starts getting cold and dark again so the mammals don't get back inside. 
Uh, trapping a shrew is very challenging. I've live caught them before so I can make videos like the one that's in the link in the video description below. That one was live caught and that's why I got up at 4.30 in the morning by the way and went and made the video about that shrew and released it because they can't handle being in captivity very long at all. They need to constantly eat and if they don't they starve and die. And I think, don't quote me on the exact number, but it's like 80% of shrews die out every winter and that's because they need a constant source of food which you have generously provided with your beehives if your entrances are too large. So I don't think I asked Nancy um, how high her entrance is but I would like to know that three eighths of an inch is the magic number and um, <clears throat> sometimes when there are especially if you have your beehives in remote areas You'll come in and check them on like these nice warm days that we just had and you'll find a nice arc in your wooden entrance reducer where a mouse took the time to chew the opening even bigger. So I bought these cool, I think these are made so that you can engrave copper or whatever, but this is a pure copper plate and you can cut it down and then you would, you don't have to cut out a three eighths of an inch uh, opening in it. What I have are three eighths inch diameter rods that I stick in the entrance and then I set this plate right down on that and then I hot glue it right to the front just for winter time. And then uh, in spring, of course, because it's hot glue, it holds its place, but you can pry it off really easy and pull it away in spring if you don't want to leave a copper plate on the front of your hive. But by having the three eighths inch, uh, they're aluminum dowel rods that I bought. And they're not dowel rods, it would be called round stock. But the aluminum round stock, I just use this placeholder, set this right down, glue it on, and then it's like a, it's a gauge to get them on there. So, and why do I use copper? Because if we're dealing with mice, for example, they go to chew the copper, it electrocutes their little mouths. Just like when you get a piece of aluminum foil and start chewing on that with your molars, you get those little shocks. They do not like to chew copper. And this is probably overkill. I like to do weird things on the hides, just... Uh, to make people ask questions and wonder why I did them. Antibacterial, by the way. So anyway, that's what I would recommend, and I do think it's shrews. And I think it uh, unlikely that it's a pygmy shrew just because of how far south we are, but if you were like up in Maine or northern Vermont or northern Massachusetts or something like that, you might, or in Canada for sure, you have the potential to have a pygmy shrew. So then the question remains, hmm, if it's a pygmy shrew, does that three-eighths of an inch uh, screen still work for that? Sure does. So, and if you can get a camera to get videos of them going in, you know you've got them feeding on one of your hives. I would have like three cameras all aiming at different angles and uh, motion activated and see that little rascal zip in and out and find out when he's coming and going. Learn their habits, learn where they're coming from, learn what they're doing. And then uh, once you know that, you can start to come up with a plan to deal with them. So, you got a shrew issue, Nancy. Let us know how it happened, what, uh, what the outcome was. Question number six comes from Brandon from Philadelphia, Missouri. <clears throat> Trying to learn more about trees in my area, 90 miles north of St. Louis. And more specifically, which trees are in bloom when and which trees the bees will utilize. My budget is low this year, so even though I would like to read many publications, is there something you would recommend as a must read when it comes to this? This is a problem whenever we're reading about stuff, but I'll tell you right away, your source would be the Missouri Arbor Society. And uh, they have arborists that know all the great strengths of the trees, but you're in a great position and a great location to use linden trees. So if you want to know what kind of tree I would put if I had your property, I would do linden trees. But I'm going to link you a video for anybody that wants to watch it. I've linked it in the past. It's an arborist that talks about he's also a beekeeper, longtime beekeeper, very well aware of the nectar value, pollen, and everything else that's coming from different tree varieties and he makes great recommendations. But I found even here where I live, our county arborist is very well versed on what trees are providing for pollinators. And also what we're looking for is the extended bloom timeframe. So you want trees that bloom for long periods of time. 
and uh, provide nectar for your bees and we'll give you the biggest bang for your buck if we're trying to be frugal with what kind of trees we're putting in. The other thing I want you to think about when we're looking at these trees, because I did it, you know, I planted three, which I understand that's not a lot, but linden trees are supposed to get huge. I planted linden trees that were only five or six feet high. I'm wondering if they're even going to get to a meaningful size in the amount of time I have left on earth. So that's the other thing. When will they be blooming? Like how old does the tree have to be before it becomes productive? If you're one of these people that needs instant gratification and you want that tree to be producing for bees next year, then you need to become acquainted with, of course, the cycle of the tree when it reproduces, whether or not it needs another tree. There's male and female. So some trees, chestnuts, for example, they need different, uh, they need male and female trees so that they can produce fruit. So then, of course, they provide for your bees at the same time. So there's a lot going on with that, but always reach out to your arborist because there most counties have an arborist and uh, I know St. Louis County would, so you can reach out because probably what's good there would still be good up where you're living north of St. Louis. So, but I will link the other one so that people can see that. It's very informative. I got great feedback on that and it's always nice to say hey to people that are giving us good information. So question number seven is from Andrew from New Ross, Waxford, I'm sorry, Wexford, Ireland. Now this is an interesting question. I wasn't even going to do it. What business do I have giving my opinion about anything that goes on in Ireland? But here's the question. Here in Ireland, there is a majority of beekeepers that are strictly AMM, black bees native. And by AMM, that means Apis mellifera mellifera. Like, for example, we've had uh, Apis mellifera, Apis mellifera ligustica, for example, so Italian bees and things like that. So each bee species is identified that way. And Apis mellifera mellifera, black bees are native to Ireland. So anyway, we're going on to what are your views on Ireland banning non-native bees to stop genetic mixing? I prefer bucks. Now, bucks is short for buckfast bees. And uh, as they're more peaceful, amusing is we had to import bees in 1923 from Europe due to <clears throat> LOWD eradicating the previous honeybee population. Do you think native bees could replace the whole country if the ban is put in place? Okay. If you think for one minute I could wade into Ireland's politics and talk about what bee they should have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reroute this whole discussion. I think it's cool, first of all. A lot of people watching or listening to this right now may not know the honeybee, Apis mellifera, Apis mellifera, is not native to the United States. It's not. So... This is why sometimes we get in these discussions with entomologists and uh, people that are kind of restore the earth, you know, back to the earth and back to nature and getting only native species, which goes from plants to animals. Um, what they want in this country is only native species. So if you're a beekeeper of Apis mellifera in the United States, you've got a non-native bee that you're keeping, um, which by the way, is brought to this country way back in the beginning. And uh, now we depend on it for our agriculture. So we don't have any choices here. But how the tide would turn for us as beekeepers if there were a native honeybee here. So when we think about that, now these people that argue against keeping honeybees um, would have a real foothold to say that we only want our native North American honeybees, if they existed, they would have a fantastic argument to keep that here. So for Andrew, who, you know, wants an opinion about what I think, thank you for thinking that my thought would have any bearing whatsoever on Ireland and how they manage their bees. I like the idea um, that you have your own native honeybee that belongs there, that's been there, uh, that wasn't brought in by people, and that uh, can manage on its own. Uh, could native bees replace the whole country? So I don't know how strong your native bee is, so I had to look into it a little more. So you have that northern dark bee, 
free living honeybees in Ireland. So these are bees that we would call in this country feral. So uh, honeybees, if you find honeybees in trees, buildings, you know, that are living in the environment here in the United States, they ultimately came from people. People brought them here. The Native Americans called them the white man's fly. And uh, we didn't even understand when we brought bees to this country that they could do anything but provide us with honey and wax for our candles. We weren't even thinking about as mankind, we weren't thinking about them being pollinators and how meaningful that would be for crop production. Now we understand all of that. But it would be cool if we had our own native bees. Um, but there were free living honeybees, which are native bees in Ireland that live three or more years without beekeepers. And the reason that that's significant to them is because uh, they're doing that now that we have the varroa destructor mite, which once again, were brought in by people. So you can look into how the varroa destructor mite was transferred to B to B to B, and which, by the way, is a terrible uh, mite because you only need one. One mite can reproduce, and then its offspring reproduce, and so on and so on. You don't need a male and a female because the female, that one foundress mite, can create a male, and then all the mating can happen, and they can reproduce. So getting one mite is a big deal. But so Ireland did this study and uh, they lived three or more years without beekeepers, so without interaction. So they're kind of demonstrating a resistance and an ability for Apis mellifera mellifera to sustain itself in Ireland. So I did a little further dive too and I find out that there's a native Irish honeybee society. And then I also found out that there's FIBCA, which is the Federation of Irish Beekeepers Association. And they're my shout out for today because I want you to watch their video, which some of you might find dry because uh, they're, what they're really talking about is the bigger picture, not just the honeybees. They're talking about climate, land management, biodiversity, all of the exact same things that we talk about here in the United States and other countries. They're talking about hedgerows and how people cut down the hedgerow too low to where it doesn't recover and things like that. So in Ireland, there's a lot of activism for not just keeping this bee as the bee, um, as the, the honeybee. They only have one species of honeybee that's native to Ireland, while we in the United States have no native honeybees. And uh, they want to keep it and they want to expand, of course, support for all pollinators, for the whole environment. And just as we are right here in the United States, they're in head-to-head -head conflict with agriculture. And the way farmers want to use their land in order to get maximum profit for every square acre that's available to them for crops, cattle, whatever. And in Ireland, dairy is a heavy thing. So they really are not wanting to concede land and they don't want to see biodiversity um, cropping up because it's non-productive land. If you're into earning money from agriculture, what incentive do you have to support bee populations and uh, biodiversity overall? If all you're thinking about is getting the most money out of your cattle for dairy production and things like that, then you want pasture land. So it's very interesting that these are arguments and discussions that are going on all over the place, hopefully. And uh, so I don't have an opinion about, I think it's cool that you have a native bee. That's, that's my opinion right there. But maybe people that are watching this, because we have a lot of people from that part of the world that uh, watch my videos. If you've got opinions about this, let's open up that conversation. I'll give a link. Uh, please you know, say hello. I don't think that YouTube channel is with Fibka. I don't think they're very responsive because I was looking at comments that were made on their videos and they weren't being responded to at all. Um, so one of the things I recommend, regardless of you know what your status is, if you're a university, if you're a government entity, if you're an organizational representative, and you produce a YouTube channel, you never know who might be commenting on your channel or watching or or be looking for an opportunity to, to support something. If you're not interacting with the people making comments, then um, how can you claim that you want support, that you want community involvement, that you want people from different parts of your country 
uh, to get on board with some action plan that you have. If when they comment and are looking for ways to get involved, there's no response to their comments. So it's not so much a criticism as it is an encouragement to interact with people on social media when they do take the time to write and uh, to ask how they can get involved or maybe they have an opinion or an idea or something that might be beneficial. If you have a YouTube channel, try to respond to your comments. So that's the shout out for today. It's going to be for the YouTube channel is Fibka, F-I-B-K-A. And uh, it stands for the Federation of Irish Beekeepers Associations. And uh, also there's uh, going to be a specific video on their deal where they were doing some business and having to kind of report what the status is of their environment. And uh, of course they had an action committee there and uh, politicians that hopefully will help get things back on the natural path in Ireland. So thanks for that question. Now we're in the fluff section. We're just talking for fun right here. And these are some things I made some notes so I wouldn't forget. <clears throat> Spring feeding. This is something that's coming up a lot. We had, uh, as again, I said, we had our beekeeper breakfast uh, this past week on Wednesday. And feeding comes up. And of course, um, when people are talking about bees that died out or they suspect they died, please do not tear apart your hives this time of year. There's nothing you're going to do with the resources in the hive, and uh, there's a very good chance. I had colonies that looked inactive, but when you put a stethoscope up against the side of them, they're humming away in there. Just because they're not flying on a nice warm day and you think they should be, that's not the time to pull apart your hive. Because we could think, wow, it's in the 60s, I'm going to pull apart this hive. Remember, their brood temperature is 94 to 97. 60s is not warm to your bees. So pulling them apart, you could be the finish of a smaller or um, colony that's not doing that well. Now, once you know for sure if a, colony, if a colony is dead, then on those foraging days, we want to make sure that you close up those entrances so that they're not robbed out until you get a chance to really evaluate it and make sure what the cause was of your bees dying out. Don't just let them get robbed. Uh, pay attention to activity on landing boards you might be walking out there with your cup of coffee and looking at your beehives. And, oh, look how active that one is. They're just great. But then if you take a closer look, you find out there's little bits of pieces of uh, beeswax and everything else being trailed out. And the real tell that they're actually being robbed instead of just being active is you'll see little sticky brown spots. It's like they're running in and out of there with dirty feet. And so you'll see these little sticky spots all over the landing board. So if that landing board is not clean, <clears throat> if you don't have any guard bees, if the activity seems not quite normal, they may actually be getting robbed. And so the time, of course, to close that up is, you know, when nightfall comes. Robbing can take days. And uh, we don't want that to happen because if there was a disease in there, if there's some kind of brood disorder, uh, we don't want that spread to all your other colonies. So please close up any what you suspect are dead outs when you know for sure there aren't bees in there because you'll be trapping them if you close it up and there's live bees in there. So the other thing is, um, <clears throat> I encourage people to set out feeding stations this time of year. Now, some states and some countries don't allow open feeding of honeybees. So I'm not suggesting that you go against any kind of ordinance or you know, regulations that you have in your state. But uh, for me personally, I have a consistent feeding station location. So on these warm days when the bees are flying out, this is a time that we can put out um, sugar syrup if you want to and there's some things that you should know if you're putting out sugar syrup please don't put it out and leave it out overnight uh, sugar syrup that is down and I'm not saying what the percentage has to be one to one or more um, but if you put it out and just leave it overnight unattended uh, first of all other animals can come after it but the other thing is it gets too cold and by that I mean if your syrup, I did these tests, I did uh, the videos and, and showed exactly what happens when bees come to a, a nectar or sugar source that's too cold for them. Uh, they take it on board, they get that in their honey crop and they get grounded for an extended period of time while they warm that up so they can fly back to their hive. If you keep your sugar syrup inside your house and keep it in the high 60s or low 70s for example, and then when it gets about 10 a.m., when most of the bees start foraging, 10 to 12, 
uh, and then you put it out on your feeder station at that temperature you'll find that they're able to come and go without being grounded so they go they get they get the carbohydrate that they want they zip that right back to their colony they bring other foragers with them and they all get as much as they can as quick as they can and uh, so then what we're doing is we're giving foragers something to do we're giving them a carbohydrate a clean carbohydrate by the way um, there are a lot of people that write and say hey can i put um you know what if i can i just put spirulina in the sugar syrup and i want to put in some uh, Honey Bee Healthy, some Pro Health, some uh, Beekeeper's Choice, and can I put in, uh, they think of everything they can think of that is supposed to be good for bees, and then they want to mix it all into their sugar syrup and then feed that to the bees. And I've always been against that. Always. And here's why. We want our bees to be picking and choosing what they want and need. We all know that bees would eat cow pie if uh, it had sugar on it. So they're so desperate for sugar, they're so desperate for carbohydrates that if that's the only source we give them, they'll take that in and everything else that's in it. So I'm not a fan at all of uh, mixing that all up together. So the other thing is we look at, uh, this is why keeping records is so important too. In the past, because I wanted to see if they would go for um, Man Lake's Ultra B Dry Pollen Substitute. So I put that out there and that gave me a lot of opportunity to see how bees interact with pollen in general. But this is of course a pollen sub, it's not real pollen. So I'm going to again, put that out separate and I noticed in my notes that they started taking pollen on March 12th where I live. It doesn't mean that you can't kind of put it out there but freshness counts when it comes to these pollen subs. So, and it's a dry pollen sub, and I put that out, uh, they only go for it for a couple of weeks. And then when actual pollen that, that surpasses, of course, the quantity and quality of what you're putting out, uh, when that kicks in, they start ignoring the Ultra B. And so this year, and I'm going to share that with you, because I also have A24, uh, which is another dry pollen substitute. And so this year, and again, I'm not mixing these in with anything, I never would. Uh, I'm putting them out as dry offerings. And uh, so starting in mid-March, I'm going to have A24 and Ultra B Dry Pollen Sub. And we're going to be seeing which of those they take the most of <clears throat> or, you know, the most readily use. And we know they both are our top performers when it comes to the scientific supporting studies that show that those are helpful to your bees. Um, in a time when real pollen is not being made available in the environment. So I'm doing that comparison coming up. And the reason I'm telling you about it is if you want to do your own comparison, maybe in the neck of the woods where you live, and then uh, you can see how that goes. But I'm going to go head to head Ultra B against A23. So, and they both have to be fresh, you know, of course, not past their expiration date and stuff like that. So, and then sugar syrup or Pro Sweet. Pro Sweet's expensive, um, uh, and I'll find that uh, sugar syrup, if you offer both of these things together, sugar syrup in one, Pro Sweet in another, you would have to thin down the Pro Sweet uh, to make it the same consistency, because that's the other thing. If we want to make comparisons to find out what your bees want to have, we need to make the parameters as close as possible to one another. But uh, Pro Sweet's expensive, sugar syrup is cheap, it's a straight carbohydrate, and that's what I would give them. Um, and the other thing is I'm not putting any of that on any of the hives themselves. They're foraging for it. So the only thing that's staying in the hives until it's consumed this year or until they start to ignore it completely is, of course, the um, Hive Alive uh, fondant. So Hive Alive fondant, once that's done and that goes off, the holes get plugged and there's no more feed above the colonies uh, when spring kicks in and the pollen's coming and the nectar's coming in. I don't have anything to feed them unless I collect a swarm or something like that. Uh, but last year I had pretty good luck uh, putting swarms in boxes uh, and not feeding those either. So we'll see, it depends on the time of year, what's going on. Uh, foragers will fly in the 40s. So if they have a known nectar source, if you've put out a feeding station or something like that and it's a sunny morning, they will fly out in 40 degree weather and go to those sites. Uh, and again, I did all of those tests and I did it with redundant um, thermometers and things like that so that we knew what the temperatures actually were 
And because, and some studies will say that bees won't even fly or can't fly until it's in the 50s, for example. So we do that to show, number one, when they're foraging. And the key there is when they're flying in the 40s, they're not foraging for new resources. What they're doing in those temperatures, they're flying out to a known resource, a known carbohydrate source, and they're returning to it. So they're not discovering it in the first uh for the first time. So for example, those who say that bees don't forage until it hits the 50s, they may be talking about when colonies send out their scouts to find new resources in the environment rather than taking the risk flying out even in the rain. They've flown out to a known nectar source that they would bring back carbohydrates from. So those are all interesting dynamics. My uh, statement for you is always question everything. Um, there are going to be a lot of companies selling products. There are a lot of feed supplements. You can always ask um, when they make claims about how it improves the bees, how did you substantiate the claim? In other words, and I said this at our bee breakfast on Wednesday, um, if you're buying an additive to your sugar syrup, for example, or if people are trying to make their own fondant and things like that, when you start getting your ingredient list together, how did you prove that those ingredients would get the results that are being claimed? Um, because a lot of backyard beekeepers want to do, it's the same people that want to mix everything together and give it all to them in one kind of super Vita pack. I don't know if you remember those for the fitness nuts out there. They gave these Vita packs or all these different mega vitamins together. And the idea is that if this is good for me and that's good for me and that's good for me, let's put it all together and make a super dose. And I don't think that's good for your bees. Let your bees pick what they want to do and always ask if somebody's saying, well, that guarantees, you know, more brood. That, that right there guarantees no nozema. If those traits, if those benefits are true and known, then the companies will have no problem giving you the links to the studies that support the claim. So even when these uh, supplements have been out and produced and widely consumed and accepted for decades in some cases, uh, if you go to the website, it should not just be a bunch of uh, statements that are under their control. So this is what makes me always suspicious. When, uh, and this is from the people that bought a product. Well, do you think for one minute a company is going to post a a statement from a consumer that is not going to support their product. And the other thing is you always want to see what studies were done, where were they done, who paid for the study. So uh, when there's science to support it, companies that have the science to support their products, they front with that because that's going to validate their claims about nosema, bee disease, things like that. And right now today, and it's not for the Hive Alive fondant, by the way, I don't have a study that publishes, uh, that has been published or reviewed by peers that uh, supports that the Hive Alive fondant does specific things to the bee midgut, for example, that improves the microbiome, that takes care of nosema. But they did have a study that supported um, the Hive Alive syrup being added to the sugar syrup. So, and that's the only one that I could find scientific studies for that supported it that held up under review. And somebody else was uh, confused when it says peer review. They thought that meant uh, that just a bunch of people that are your peers said, hey, it's good. I say it's good. John says it's good. And Tammy says it's good. It's good. Peer review means other scientists. It means they've challenged the scientific method that was used and they've combed through the data and they've come through the summary and they review and agree with the process and then of course the findings. So it's not just a bunch of people going, hey, you're my peers, let's, let's talk about it and say it's great. So anecdotal statements are those that say, hey, I put that in my hive, my hive did great, must be good. Um, so I'm science-based, therefore I need the science behind it. And I always recommend that people do that because some of the stuff is very expensive. So you need to find out, is it really going to do what they say it's going to do and look for the science behind it. So your entrances, three eighths of an inch high, two to three inches wide in spring. And uh, 
of course, not everybody's going to do that. It's perfectly okay. I'm just saying what I'm doing and why. Because in spring, what's going to happen is you're going to get those rainy days and weak colonies. And so here comes the Darwinian line of thinking. Well, if they're weak and they can be overrun by a stronger colony, who cares? They just thin them out. Uh, I highly recommend that you reduce entrances or keep them reduced um, while your colonies are building up so that they're not challenged by robbing and stress. We know that the robbing and stress this time of year primarily comes just from other honeybees. And uh, that's because the wasps and hornets are not uh, getting traction until much later. And that's because uh, wasps are wintering solitary as queens. And then each queen in spring will be starting up their own colonies. So that threat is way down the road. And that's why we don't have problems with wasps assaulting our uh, bee colonies until we get to the end of summer. So for right now, uh, keep your entrances reduced. Don't be really excited. Oh, I'm going to talk about my hoodie that I'm wearing right now because all these pockets that are on here and stuff like that, where do I get a hoodie like this? Uh, my wife makes it. So here's what I do. And this is a good idea for people that like pockets everywhere because if you're like me, you go out to your bee yard, you want a magnifying glass, you want a marking pen. And the more pockets I have on my hoodie, uh, the more convenient all these tools are. So we take old hoodies that are going to be thrown away or whatever, and my wife cuts pieces off of them, patches out of them, and she sews them onto my hoodie and makes a bunch of custom pockets so that I can have stuff stuck in them that I need. Queen holder, you know, anything that you want. Just the same thing with old blue jeans, by the way. If you don't care how you look, right, and uh, you're not totally vain, you can be wearing a pair of blue jeans that has a bunch of weird pockets all over them that look like cargo pants, but it's really just old worn out blue jeans that pieces are cut off of it and they're stitched to the legs and the calf muscle and all the other parts of your pants where you might want to be putting things in your pockets. So it's a way to recycle. Oh, the other thing is somebody last asked last time, baseball hats. So I did design some baseball hats for Teespring. I'm not that excited about them. And then it occurred to me um, that this is the old square patch that I saw, but now we have the round ones that are iron on. So if you want a way to be ball cap, I really recommend that you just get your favorite ball cap, whatever design you like, whatever size you like, whatever style and everything else, and then just get the iron on patch and put that on your ball cap instead of everything's expensive on teespring so and like i said i didn't really like it that much it's embroidered straight on the cap but it lacked a lot of detail these have a lot of detail it says the way to be this is the way to be and uh, you can just iron that on to your hat and some people did that it was a great idea get the hat you like get the patch separate and just put the two together i'm not excited about uh, the ball caps that came out so close up dead outs, already did that. If syrup is inside the hive, do not center it. I know I said that before, but I want to say it again. If you've got your inner cover and you're trying to early feed your bees, if you center that directly, and I know the inner cover is where's the entrance. The entrance is right in the middle. So um, cut another hole on your inner cover further to the back or off to a corner and uh, use your jar to feed your bees off center. Don't let that nectar express or sugar syrup or whatever you're putting on there, don't let that go right down on your bees. If you've got like, this is crystallized honey. If you've got an inner cover and uh, you've got the hole there um, and it's during these colder periods, you can put this right on that hole and then you can let your bees go up here and clean out crystallized honey because that does not drip down into your hive at all. So that's something else that you can do with that. But crystallized honey is very valuable, worth a lot more than a little uh, sugar syrup. But uh, these are just ideas, but I really want you to keep your uh, anything that would drip down on your bees that would run down onto your brood, your developing brood, if... Um, once you get your brood covered with a heavy syrup in particular, the heavier the syrup, the more dangerous it is to your bees inside. If it goes over your open larvae, it will kill them in a very short amount of time. And that's because it plugs up their spiracles. 
And when it does that, they're just dead. And then you're going to see bees cleaning out dead bees on your landing boards in the early mornings. That's the other thing I highly recommend. While um, we're having these cold nights and warmer mornings, it's a great opportunity for you to go out and look at landing boards and see what's on them. Because later on in the day, of course, they're all cleaned up by your bees. So you want to see what's going on, what kind of brood is being removed and stuff like that. If you see a bunch of brood on your landing board and it's the day following a date that you did a, a quick inspection of your brood, very good chance you chilled your brood and they're cleaning up after you. So chilled brood is no joke. Uh, don't open your hives unless you absolutely have to. And uh, keep an eye on your top box, of course, as you get the warmer days. It's all redundant. We talked about it already. And so that is it for today. So I want to thank you for being here and for listening. And hopefully you've got comments that you can share down before, down below. And I hope you'll visit that uh, Irish YouTube channel and, and listen to what they're dealing with there. Because actually what they're talking about applies to uh, land use all over the world. I wish that uh, we were all concerned. And it sounds like uh, things are not going well in Ireland. So I hope that uh, as spring comes in, you'll share with everyone that you can how important it is to maintain biodiversity. Try to get people, you know, the more you know, the less you mow, things like that. In spring, dandelions are coming up. Not harmful to people. 100% of the dandelions edible. And uh, if you want to know what pollen is coming to your area or when your bees are going to be benefiting from it, just download a pollen, a pollen app, which are allergy apps for your phone. And they're set up for people that suffer from seasonal allergies. But what they're really good for is letting the beekeeper know which days, and I found this to be very accurate, which days the pollen was going to be the highest. And that's when you would see the most pollen gathering activity for your bees on the landing board. So some people use pollen traps and things like that to collect seasonal pollen. I don't personally do it. I've tested the traps and I've done that before. But I would uh, make that coincidental with uh, when the pollen alarms are kind of out for people that are suffering from spring pollen allergies. So thanks for being here. I hope you're going to have a fantastic weekend. And I hope on the next warm up, you find lots of things to do to help your bees. Thanks for watching. Okay. So you gotta open the door.